Welcome to the third in our series of workshops on developing the next generation of research leaders for sustainable development. WUN is offering the series in collaboration with UNESCO and with the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. The workshops are intended to help enlarge the networking opportunities for researchers in the early stages of their careers. An important part of WUN's mission is to nurture research talent. And historically, we've done that through a mobility program aimed at, an er at early career researchers. That program, along with many of the other means by which researchers typically establish their collaborative networks, has of course been upended by COVID-19. This series of workshops is a response to that. They're intended to help researchers find peers and potential collaborators who have related interest. But we're not viewing the workshops as just a stopgap until life gets back to normal. If they're a success, we will have created a vehicle for enlarging opportunity generally, and especially for researchers whose freedom to collaborate internationally has in the past been limited by financial or other restrictions on travel. The emphasis on the SDGs, each workshop will explore one and the research challenges it attended stems from WUN's adoption of sustainable development as a principal research focus of its strategic plan. Later in this session, I'll say more about the particulars of our research agenda and the ways in which you can become involved in it. But first, we'll hear from four panelists. A keynote from special guest Raf Tutz from UN Habitat, followed by snapshots from three leading WUN researchers who will characterize some of the rich research challenges and opportunities presented by Goal 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. I'd like first to introduce Ralph Tertz. He is Director of the Global Solutions Division of the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, and is based at its headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. Ralph is overseeing the development and application of UN Habitat's normative guidelines through global initiatives that cover various aspects of sustainable urbanization. He is currently leading an agency-wide effort to study city responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, with a focus on rethinking the form and function of the city, addressing systematic poverty and inequality in cities, rebuilding a new normal urban economy, and clarifying urban legislation and government governance arrangements. Ralph, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this kind introduction. Um, I'll try to share my screen um, and then um, start my, my remarks. So, in this uh, session, uh, I would like to touch on three different uh, questions. First of all, what is the value of multilateral collaboration in addressing uh, goal 11? And why actually do we need a standalone goal on urbanization? Second, what are some of the opportunities for uh, strengthened international research on related to the measurement framework of SDG 11 and finally some more specific thematic areas of research that we see as priority. Let's start with the why. Why do we need, did we need this goal and why it was so important to have this goal? In fact, it was a watershed moment in the, the history of the uh, development history since the, the Second World War when for the first time urbanization was seen as a driver for development, for sustainable development, rather than um, an obstacle or a an hindrance. And UN Habitat together with many other agencies, including SDSN, was advocating for a standalone goal on sustainable cities and communities. Uh, it was quite competitive because uh, at one point there was a need to narrow down from 26 goals down to uh, the 17 goals that we have now. And um, many countries, many institutions were not convinced that urbanization needed to be a separate goal. But I think this 
um, argument was won and now we are in the implementation phase and um, we're going to look at some of the challenges also related to this implementation. One of the uh, opportunities, let's put it this way, is the connection between SDG 11 and the new urban agenda, which was adopted just one year later in 2016 by the, the General Assembly of the United Nations and provides more of the how. How can we achieve these ambitious targets in SDG 11? Talks about compact cities, about integrated communities, about connected um, urban fabrics. Uh, and, and really making a value statement. And I think this is very important to look at these two agendas together, SDG 11 and the new urban agenda as an implementation tool. Now, moving back to SDG 11, uh, what is very particular uh, amongst these targets is that some of these are totally new. Uh, there was never in the development uh, world any measurement or monitoring of the quality of public space, for instance, or cultural heritage preservation. These are new targets which were introduced by member states to complement, of course, the other goals, which are sometimes very closely related. Um, you can see in these 10 targets, there is nothing on water, there's nothing on energy, while these are very important topics that were addressed in other, in other goals. But I would like to focus a bit on the need that this goal brought for a new measurement uh, methodology, um, a new set of spatial indicators that were needed to monitor goals that, that are marked here uh, on housing, on sustainable transport, on planning, and on, on public space. Um, these are the four uh, targets that really need a very specific spatial um, methodology. And this will also allow um, member states, cities, to allocate resources where they're most needed from a territorial point of view, rather than from a, a sectoral uh, point of view. Now, this gives, this provides some opportunities to uh, research institutions. Um, we, we know that uh, to get this monitoring system in place, there's a multitude of actors that are in, involved um, at the city level, at the, at the national uh, level, uh, statistical agencies, etc. A lot of capacity development has taken place in different parts of the world, not only to familiarize uh, cities and city practitioners with this new set of indicators, but also with the very definition of what is urban which uh, as you know, definitions are very different in different countries and to en enable to have a global monitoring, we needed to have a system, a global common use functional system of what is urban and not urban in this world. We also needed to familiarize um, cities and different um, implementing mechan um, agencies with, this, with these new technologies uh, using geospatial data and uh, what is quite new is the emergence of the voluntary local reviews, which complement the national um, reviews, the voluntary national reviews, which are issued by countries. There's been a trend, especially the last year. So this is after five years of implementation, there's an emergence of voluntary local reviews, which are actually city SDG reports, not only focusing on SDG 11, but on the full set of SDGs. So we have been working with um, many countries all over the world and many cities in each of these countries to build this capacity uh, for the understanding of the challenges and the opportunities of this sustainable development goal. There are also some challenges, uh, challenges uh, not the least uh, because the goal SDG 11 requires that you have a connectivity between the national government, the subnational, could be provincial, could be state government, and the city government in making this connection, because many of the of the SDG 11 targets require that connection from bottom to uh, to country level. The disaggregation of of data uh, is is critical, as in many other SDGs, but also the high cost. And so you introduce a new, a new methodology, but you also you introduce a need for sampling that has to be relevant because cities are very different. In a certain country, 
the intermediary cities are fundamentally different than maybe some of the larger uh, cities. And then within every city, some neighborhoods are also very, very different. So you need to take your sample in a very deliberate way so that you don't leave any neighborhoods, any significant different neighborhoods behind. So then uh, this has been going on for five years, developing the methodology, getting all the indicators uh, cleared um, through the Statistical Commission of the UN, and then countries start developing their reports. And then you can imagine the, the, the challenges at this level. You have countries like India, which have um, 1.3 billion people and 370 million urban residents, which come up with their own reports on each of the targets and each of the indicators uh, in their own way based on their definitions and their um, strategies. And then you have other, uh, on the other side of the spectrum, um, for instance, uh, a city like Cabaron in, in Botswana, capital city, which only has 250,000 inhabitants and which also develops an own report going systematically target by target and what it means for the urban population of also a middle income country uh, of Botswana. So you can see the extrapolation challenges, um, the um, divergence of different uh, situations, but still measuring the same indicators and the same towards the accomplishment of the same targets. I'd like to close with uh, highlighting some research opportunities, um, both holistically and also specifically. First, holistically, I think it is absolutely important that whatever we do in terms of new research at this point is helping to create this evidence base that the new urban agenda can accelerate the achievement of SDG 11 and other, other SDGs. This is critical. So that means compact cities, how, in what way are compact cities going to contribute to some of SDG 11 uh, indicators. So linking these value statements with the measurement. Um, so not only compactness, but also the, the values of integration, of connectivity, social inclusion, and climate resilience. I think these are the key values that are promoted in the new urban agenda, and that can be measured through the, the SDGs. This is very important because we have a window of opportunity. We do not believe that in 2030, all these targets will, will be achieved. That will be very difficult, but we have an opportunity to demonstrate the value of this, um, of this standalone goal uh, to, to accelerate sustainable development through an urbanization lens, because the large majority of the urban fabric is yet to be built by 2050. So there's so much opportunity and this is the right moment to address it. Now to, col to close some specific targets and I've deliberately picked targets that are not going to be discussed by uh, the other speakers. First housing, specifically related to housing, we need better research that analyzes access to housing versus availability of housing. That means the location versus the avail availability and the affordability question. It's an, it's an economic um, issue. It's an issue of uh, with environmental and social uh, dimension. It's very, but not sufficient research is being done. Uh, second, spatial footprint. How can we the, the, the help countries to differentiate between density and overcrowding, having good density, and that, that doesn't lead to overcrowding, and that creates also good quality public space. And, and how can we um, optimize the user value and the, and the safety of public spaces? Because again, that's one of the targets of this um, SDG. Not enough research is being done. There are elements, but they need to be expanded. And finally, um, we are having a database of 150 national urban policies. We are following this trend, but we need much better research about what are the drivers, what are driving countries to engage in urban policy making and to change urban policy, because that's a fundamental building block towards achieving SDG 11. I leave it here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shraf, uh, for this very illuminating overview of, of the major issues. Um, I'd now like to turn to Sylvia Hur, 
who is an associate professor in the Urban Studies Program and Department of Geography and Resource Management at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She is Honorary Secretary of the Hong Kong Society for Transportation Studies and Fellow of the Regional Studies Association. Her research interests include travel behavior, transport planning and policy, transport geography, urban and regional studies, and spatial analysis. She is the principal investigator on the WUN collaborative project on, how, on low carbon transport, uh, individual well being, and planetary health in the era of smart cities and new mobilities. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Peter, for the nice introduction. So I will share my uh, PowerPoint. So, um, so I'm uh, Sylvia He, uh, Associate Professor from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, today I'm very delighted to have the opportunity uh, uh, to share my uh, uh, project funded by WUN Low Carbon Transport in the area of smart cities and new mobilities. I think uh, Ralph just had a very nice um, overview about the SDG.11 and one of this is about transport. And in uh, my project, uh, we have uh, four participating uh, universities from the Wood Network and also nine non-Wood uh, partner universities. So a total 13 universities from uh, four continents. So in our project, we try to answer the question that in the area of uh, smart cities, we have uh, new and emerging new mobility uh, such as electric vehicle, bike share and e-scooters. But are these uh, new transport uh, modes moving us towards a better well-being and planetary health? This is the question we try to answer in this project. And as we can see from um, this uh, uh, US uh, uh, EPD figure, carbon dioxide accounts for 81% of the greenhouse gas emission and transport accounts for 34% of the carbon dioxide emission. So in total, the transport sector accounts for close to 30% of the greenhouse gas emission. And even in Hong Kong, which is a very high density, transit oriented and uh, uh, less car dependent region, the transport sector still accounts to close 20% of the greenhouse gas emission. That being said, if we want to combat against climate change and uh, build more sustainable cities and communities, there are a lot of to do uh, for the transport sector. So um, this one project is actually built upon uh, a previous internally funded project, uh, which is titled Planning Hong Kong's Low Carbon Transport. So uh, that is me uh, five years ago in a, a press conference, along with my colleague, Professor Leng Yi. And uh, so we have a, a report and a number of uh, news articles all available for download from the website. And in this report, we highlighted six uh, strategies for uh, low carbon transport including uh, uh, promoting active transport, such as walking and cycling, extend a public transport network, including the rail network and bus network. Uh, also, we need to promote electric vehicle and develop the charging network and adopt more aggressively pricing strategies, experiment uh, by sharing and car sharing, and also need to have more open informatics or open data platforms. And over the past few years, my research team have done uh, uh, extensive research on various uh, transport modes, such as uh, the metro and uh, the rail uh, system in Shenzhen and Hong Kong, respectively. Also, the dockless bike share in Shenzhen and the electric vehicle charging network in Beijing. So you can see that all these are low carbon transport modes and uh, uh, how we can really understand the impact of this transport mode to the environment and the individual well-being. That is, I think, a lot of research to be done in the next uh, decade. So related to our project, we have uh, a number of uh, activities. The first one was done last November. We have organized the first online workshop. We have uh, uh, speakers and discussion from eight universities and also have uh, received over 120 participants from 20 countries. So in this workshop, we talk about 
uh, how um, uh, transport related to uh, the COVID and also related to uh, health and environment in general. And another keyword in my work uh, in our project is actually smart cities. And uh, indeed, it is quite uh, aligned well with my new course on smart cities. Just a couple of days ago, I organized a seminar about the smart cities in Hong Kong and Japan. And I invited practitioners from both Japan and Hong Kong to talk about the latest project on smart cities. And uh, later this year, I will actually give a talk about big data in travel behavior and urban transport research in the CRLT Hong Kong live seminars on smart cities and smart mobilities. And lastly, uh, in our project, we also want to organize uh, further uh, uh, events. So the next one, we plan to have more uh, uh, early career researchers to be involved. So if you yourself or your colleagues have done any research related to the topics, related to transport, news, uh, uh, mobility, smart cities, health or environment, uh, please, please uh, uh, feel free to drop me a line through email or LinkedIn. I hope to have you in the next workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia, for this very interesting account of your project. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Shiyama Ramani, who's a professorial fellow at the United Nations University Merit at Maastricht University. Thank the research, you. Sorry, the re I'm sorry, I can, I, I'd like to introduce you. Yes. Um, her, her research focuses on the relationships between technology, innovation, and their governance for inclusive development. Her work examines the role of technology and innovation in conjunction with actor engagements to, astain, to attain sustainable development goals related to gender equality, sanitation, sustainable cities and communities, and education and climate change. She is the principal investigator on the WUN collaborative project on a cross-national study of urban solid waste management, learnings and the way forward. Over to you, Xi'an. Thank you. I'm sorry to have, uh, voila, cut short. Uh, this is going to be a different narrative because you know, it's difficult to present uh, the, um, the results on a number of countries, but I want to inspire the young researchers who are watching this to make use of opportunities like the WUN uh, research grant. Um, I want to say that uh, there are now many large projects available and there are also small projects and often it is the small projects which allow for much greater creativity and exploration and that was the case here also this was actually championed by a master student a student who was a master student at the time because she was so fascinated by sdg 11. Uh, she is now a phd student and i i do want to invoke the butterfly effect and the poetry of Rabindranath Tagore says you never know when you might encounter, you see, infinity and change yourself. For all of us, it was a very big change to do this project. Why? I just wanted to tell you what really shook us up was the organization. Sorry, this, this should come afterwards. Our objective here was international collaborative research. So we were about eight different research teams coming from four different countries put together and we actually kept on interacting and we had our first knowledge workshop in Accra. But thanks to the enthusiasm of the members, we could actually link it up and reach out to a much larger audience uh, connected to the, the larger role of sanitation in SDG 11. And we really got great insight. But what changed our lives was really field visit. You see, we often 
study SDG 11 looking at data. While data is very important in order to design solutions to the problems that people face, especially the poorer people. And uh, we were looking at waste. So we were looking at the people in the waste management sector, the sources of waste, how waste was being managed, and the policy with respect to waste management, and the role of international trade. Right now, China has banned the uh, receiving plastic bags into its country, but there are many other countries where it still goes. For example, Ghana is the repository of electronic waste from all over the world. And while this is generating employment, it is, it is posing very harsh conditions and uh, on the local people. So this, to discuss these aspects, that is waste generation, waste management, movement towards a circular economy and actually making everyone accountable at both the societal level as well as the international level was the focus of our theme. And we had a wonderful conference with people from different African countries actually visiting the sites with us. And this was a uh, a changing moment because we spent quite a lot of time at the sites talking to the people. So now what has happened is that as a result, we are all working on a book on SDG 11. Rootledge, the academic publisher, is bringing out a book, book series. And uh, when uh, they came to me, I proposed SDG 11. So if any of you also have any work, please let me know. Though we are kind of full, I would like to consider it. What I want to say is that it has triggered off a process which has gone far beyond the initial project. First of all, that master student is now a PhD student, Maria Tomai, she would be in the audience. And then it has stimulated in our institute in my colleagues also, an interest in SDG 11. We are focused on technology and innovation for sustainable development. And what we need is a systemic transformation, as Ralph said in the beginning. So we are now developing a series of uh, papers, okay, works actually done by the students, which are looking at field level data district level data, zonal data, which are forming part of their dissertation. Another good thing was that in our meetings with Ghana, in Ghana, we met the Ghana uh, entrepreneurs in, at the site and through them, we got a project funded by the UNDP on how schools can be the motor of change. So what started as a WN project has gone on to be implemented. It is currently being tested out in 22 Ghanaian schools. Furthermore, over this time, over this one and a half years, we have been able to develop a community and we have also tried for some European Commission, uh, European Union projects supported by the Commission. So I wanted to say that never miss a small opportunity because as far as uh, with all due respect to everyone, uh, I was questioned as why go for a small project because we are asked to go only for big projects. But it is very good to go for small projects because they allow for creativity and opening up in a way that big projects with milestones, with extremely concrete milestone cannot open up. So this is the kind of vision that I wanted to present to the young researchers and uh, wanted to say that if any of you want the book or want more information, you're most welcome to write to me. And we also publish series on the SDGs. We call them the SDG briefs. So if you want to send us any work, we are, you are most welcome.
Okay, thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you, Shiyama, for this very interesting account of the development of your project. Our final panelist is Hendrik Tiebin. Hendrik is an urban designer, researcher and educator devoted to the creation of healthy and inclusive cities. He's an associate professor and associate director of the School of Architecture at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where he leads the MSc program in urban design. Over the last year, he's developed a series of public space and placemaking projects to empower local communities. And his current WUN collaborative project, analyzing the role of urban forms and making sustainable, healthy cities, is focused on the relationships between urban forms, health, and well being. Hendrik? Okay. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, and thank you very much for all the other speakers already uh, and also the introduction of uh, Raphael. And in fact, um, our project for Woon also um, started basically based on, on discussions before that we had uh, um, over the last years already, how we can engage with the SDGs and uh, particularly the new urban agenda. So we had the opportunity to be in Quito uh, when uh, it was basically uh, adopted and um, um, particularly we were interested in um, obviously uh, the uh, SDG uh, 11 and uh, uh, as, as we have today also the talk about this uh, um, topic and uh, particularly 11.7 public space and also uh, as Raphael was mentioning uh, 11.3 densities, uh, being in Hong Kong, <laughs> this is a kind of very interesting point, right? And um, in this context, uh, we built up also this relatively small, but for us meaningful project uh, uh, on analyzing the role of urban forms. So as, as uh, designers, uh, uh, urban designers, um, to work together with people from the background uh, of health and uh, see what are the relationships. And we teamed up with the University of Auckland and uh, also University of Sydney and uh, NTU in uh, Taipei, uh, and also invited uh, guests from uh, Western University in Canada. Now, uh, as we know, many things uh, came very different from what we expected. Uh, we were working on this project in 2019, uh, but then basically, uh, obviously in 2020, things uh, started to, to unravel uh, and we had to basically rethink entirely our activities that we wanted to do and also thought, okay, maybe is this also an opportunity to, to do something slightly different because in fact, our, uh, uh, the heart of our project, basically urban form on healthy cities became something so much more important than we, we even uh, 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 thought, right? So um, in this context, we then teamed up with an additional partner um, that is um, uh, Journal of Public Space, uh, which is actually a partner of uh, uh, UN Habitat. In fact, we, we launched the journal together at, uh, in Quito <laughs> and uh, had the opportunity to, to present it there. And um, uh, um, used basically this platform as, as uh, something for a new initiative. Um, uh, where we thought maybe we can contribute something to this uh, very special crisis, uh, looking from Asia also to all our friends and other people in, in other parts of the world. Um, and so basically in April, we set up um, this initiative, uh, 2020, a year without public space under the COVID-19 pandemic, because I think we thought we were in, anyway public space enthusiasts, let's say, but uh, we felt like, of course, uh, in the pandemic, it, it became so clear that how we all are longing for using public space, how important it is to, to connect to other people, but also economically important. On the other end, also dangerous because we can also be infected there. And then in this context, uh, last uh, uh, points here, um, we set up, uh, an initiative, uh, this initiative, and uh, basically it functions in this way that we had every uh, Thursday uh, a webinar from beginning of May um, up to November, where we had a, a big final symposium where also uh, Peter 
was joining us and many other speakers. Uh, so in fact, we had uh, over 100 uh, speakers uh, from basically um, six continents. And the idea also in this event was that everyone who's interested, particularly also in other parts of the world, could contact us and be part of the sharing and, and uh, talk about their experiences. So basically, um, we, we had basically uh, this, uh, all these contributions. Now, I show this from the website also because uh, when you are now um, listening to us, uh, you can also basically follow um, these uh, um, all these webinars because it is a, a kind of um, web archive here. Uh, all our um, webinars uh, are on videos and you can basically uh, um, still uh, listen to them. Uh, we had uh, in, in total over 100 speakers here uh, and participants from, from 18, uh, 80 countries. Um, now, uh, since then, um, of course, our work continues. Um, we are now at the moment having an initiative where we work also with uh, Hong Kong Institute of Architects and Hong Kong Institute of Planners on healthy cities with, with professional institutes and see how we can implement it more specifically in the city. And also uh, with further research, particularly very local in areas, uh, particularly low income areas here in Hong Kong that are very badly affected, uh, not by the virus, but basically uh, because um, the, the uh, mental health effects and so on of this uh, very special situation. Okay, I want to stop here just uh, to say for all that are joining us, um, how, how much these crises, of course, uh, can be also taken as something um, to see like what we can we do positively in this situation. And it, in fact, it felt us, uh, uh, all of us felt much more empowered when we started to, to do something about this topic. But also it shows us um, that particularly this topic, we have to work together across borders and across disciplines. And so I hope maybe we can find new collaborations and Boon was very uh, helpful in this context. Yeah, that's all from my side. Maybe I stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Hendrik, for this very interesting account of how your project has absorbed the effects of the pandemic. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions from, from the participants to the to the panelists. Uh, Eva, can you navigate that for us? Thank you, Peter. Um, I will present a couple of questions at a time to the panelists. The first one is for Raf. What kinds of research are important in promoting compact, integrated and connected cities? You mentioned the drivers of changing urban policy as a priority, but are there other priorities from the perspective of UN Habitat that researchers should be pursuing? And the second question is to all panelists. How has the pandemic shifted the landscape for research related to public space and urban challenges? I can go to you first, Raf. Thank you. No, this is a very good question and I think a very important one too. I would say that uh, one of the, within this dilemma or that, that uh, the, the, the challenge is to make, to looking at compact integrated and connectivity at the same time, one of the most difficult parts there is the social integration. I would say that economic integration, that is integrating economic sectors or mixity, bringing housing uh, together with um, uh, economic functions um, uh, you know, uh, avoiding monolithic cities. It's already a lot of research is done. But within uh, communities, mixing different uh, groups. And uh, so it's a social research about hindrances to further social integration is perhaps the most difficult uh, challenge. And um, one that um, you know, in 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 the history of the United States, for instance, is also led last year to to very difficult situations. And it's what what we see there is that it is not just a, a de facto segregation, but it is a de jure. It's a systematic attempt to segregate that has led to certain urban development problems. So we believe that type of research is very critical, and not enough has been done at different levels. Should I answer the question about the pandemic or I leave that for later? 
please go ahead. Well, uh, as um, Peter has said in the introduction, we are now finalizing and launching next week, actually, um, a report. Uh, it's, um, it's almost one year of research that we have done internally uh, with UN Habitat and looking at four different dimensions of how um, the pandemic is impacting on, the, on our mandate, which is essentially SDG 11. Uh, we know that the pandemic has set back the achievement of SDG, all the, SD, all the sustainable development goals. That, that's in terms of the achievement. But we are questioning how should we change our advice? How should we change our guidelines? So we have systematically looked at guidelines related to, for instance, slum um, upgrading, uh, basic services, public space, urban rural linkages, very importantly, and then see that what the pandemic has taught us on how we should advise cities and governments in a different way, or which new elements that we need to integrate. Because much of the things that we spoke about today are still very much valid, but sometimes you need to adjustments to make sure that that resilient, resilient city approach that is needed for a possible additional pandemic is embedded in the guidance that we provide. So again, this is, I think, a must for all researchers to have a, a layer of questioning about what does it mean in a pandemic situation, uh, the questions of density, the questions of public space, the questions of connectivity, how are they viewed through a different lens now? Thank you. Thank you, Raf. We have about five more minutes left if any of the other panelists would like to also answer that question. Well, maybe I go first about the impact of pandemic. And some of my uh, uh, project members kind of make fun that because pandemic now we're really low carbon travel because we cannot really travel across the country or even across the city. I think for um, the city, um, I think other panelists mentioned it impacted the function of city, the collaboration effect of the, the city. So I think that activities are no longer uh, the same as before. And uh, in terms of thing, uh, our uh, daily life, a lot of us experience a work from home and that does not really involve much travel. And uh, so related to my project transport, so I think a lot of the transport operators say in Hong Kong are experiencing uh, a, a loss. And I think a lot of airline companies are also experiencing this. So after the pandemic, whether people will resume the same type of daily movement, mobility, and require the same amount of transport uh, infrastructure. I think that uh, I think, uh, is an interesting question to explore. So I'll, I'll stop here. Um, if, okay, if I may. The, the thing is, in our WUN project, for, there were three points which were really highlighted. The first thing is to achieve SDG 11. It's not only the state, we are all accountable. So it's to build this shared vision. And to build a shared vision, especially the state has to develop legitimacy for its actions. And uh, what the pandemic showed us is that this is such a big challenge, as we noted, you see, to not to observe social distancing, to have wear masks. There is so much of social unrest to these basic hygiene behavior uh, mandates, you know, the, or uh, recommendations. So it is, if the pandemic is anything of a trailer to come for SDG 11, the challenge is going to be, how do we build a shared vision? The second thing that we want to say is accountability. That, that's the other thing that we are going to bring about in the book. We are all part of the problem. No state can solve it. We are part of the problem. We are part of the solution. So we need to change our behavior. So how to bring in this accountability is also uh, something that has really arisen through this pandemic. And I think it is throwing up more questions. We don't have the solution, but I think this is at the heart of the matter philosophically. Uh, to achieve any of the SDG 11 goals, targets. I'm, I'm good, yeah. Maybe from my side also, um, 
my my view is uh, uh, living in this part of um, of the world that when we look at uh, those places that have experienced uh, SARS in 2003, um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, mainland China, um, that um, there were a lot of advantages uh, through learning from this earlier epidemic. And uh, it also shows us that not necessarily those points that are very important for sustainable cities public transport, mass transport and density has not, uh, we don't need to uh, avoid them uh, necessarily to, to fight the pandemic. In fact, exactly those places have the, the lowest uh, infection numbers uh, now uh, uh, in the world with, with some other countries, right? Uh, which is very interesting, but comes of course uh, from a very, uh, a lot of other measures, right? A uh, uh, particular mask and so on. Uh, but also what we could see, and that's also something in many places uh, became so so clear, is uh, how other effects, like uh, particularly uh, the pandemic has, has a lot of mental effects, other effects, not only the infection, and how they became particularly bad in areas where uh, big housing uh, inequality is uh, roughly uh, uh, mentioned housing affordability and so on. And uh, if uh, places are not dealing with those, those uh, fundamental points, uh, which is a very big problem here in Hong Kong, right? Um, then there's all kinds of other problems, right? Uh, that we are at the moment uh, facing. So um, I think that's, that's really looking forward a very important uh, part. And that's also probably why Raphael had his as a first point in his list, right? I would second that, yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank all the, the panelists for their contributions. Uh, it, it, this is, they were extremely illuminating and I hope uh, everyone has found them valuable. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about, about the uh, engagement with WUN. As background to the workshops, uh, I'd like to tell you what's distinctive about WN and the opportunities to engage with it so that you can have that in mind as you get together for discussion. The key attribute that WN brings to the table is the diversity of its member universities. They're all major research universities that sit in very different geographical, cultural and legal contexts that not only shape how they support research and deliver education, but also provide them with distinctive varied perspectives on many important research problems. WUN adds value because by capitalizing on the varied geographies and cultures of its members, it can assemble and support diverse teams of collaborators to tackle major research problems in fields where comparative analysis matters. Let me say a few words about becoming engaged. We're eager for your engagement in our programs. The network provides a wide conduit to interesting and sometimes surprising international research collaborations. Many of them address real world problems and offer opportunities for researchers to deploy their disciplinary expertise in new ways. So how can you become engaged with what we do? Let me just show you. My screen here. The first thing for, for is, is uh, WN's mechanism for supporting research, the, the, the Research Development Fund. This is a small grants program intended to seed collaborative work that we hope will lead to major continuing projects. The WN website has pages covering current and previous projects. There's an annual competition. It opens in July, closes in October. It supports work under the large umbrella of sustainable development. Early career researchers are eligible to participate in the RDF. So we, we encourage you to explore opportunities for collaboration in your breakout sessions. The second thing we do is organize research activities through four global challenge steering groups in which you can also become engaged. Beyond the research development fund, these groups also organize workshops and, collab and larger collaborative projects within the domains, understanding cultures, public health, 
responding to climate change and global higher education and research. So how to connect? Uh, sign up with the WN Hub, a platform for WN researchers to research and connect with colleagues and ongoing WN research projects. Under the research tab on the website, you can find information on how to contact our global challenge steering groups. Each WN university has a local coordinator whose details are available on the governance page of our website. Co coordinators are happy to help you launch your engagement in WUN. Uh, we'll send a follow-up email summarizing these ways to engage after this session. And our WN secretariat staff are also happy to answer questions that you might have and opportunities to engage with us. Uh, during the breakout workshop sessions we're about to start, there's a room called WUN Support where our staff can answer your, your questions, any you have about engagement with us or the projects in general. Thank you all for joining us and I'll now hand over to Eva, who will organize the breakout rooms.